Hey guys, Jake Carlson here, host of the Modern Leadership Podcast. Are you ready to focus on amplifying your leadership superpowers? Let's go. Hello, my friends and fellow elite achievers. Welcome back to a brand new episode of the Modern Leadership Podcast. I hope you recognize how awesome today is. Another day to go after your dreams, your passions, and find your success. It is a pleasure to be with you on this journey. Things have been exciting around here, and I can't thank you enough for spending this time with me. Without further ado, I can't wait to jump into this week's leadership discussion with our new friend, Nitin Choda. You're going to love this guy, a story of struggle and triumph and defining the American dream. Nitin came to the United States just after 9-11 in 2002 with no money, no family, no friends, but he had a dream, a passion, and the commitment to work for it. During those first years, he worked as a waiter, often waiting until customers left so he could eat because he couldn't afford food. He slept in his car because he couldn't afford rent. Let me stop and just say, wow. How about you? What level of sacrifice are you willing to endure to find your success? Nitin is the founder of Total Activation, a skincare and nutrition line, along with several other businesses grossing high seven figures annually, and the author of Total Activation, the five-step fitness mantra. He overcame self-doubt, developed confidence, and transformed into a successful entrepreneur. And he is here with us today. Nitin, welcome to the Modern Leadership Podcast. How are you? I'm good, Jake. How are you? Thanks for having me. You know, it's a pleasure to have you on the podcast to talk about all these things. I love this title of this book that you have, and I love your story, and I want to jump into it more because I believe the world is flat, and it's getting flatter, and we just got back as a family from spending 12 months overseas. We lived in 12 different countries, and the big key takeaway that I had is that there are great, talented, smart just wonderful people all across the world that are doing amazing things. And so it's great to hear your story. And I want to talk about that a little bit. Now, you came over to the United States back right after 9-11. Can you take us back to that time and kind of give us a sense of what was going on? Well, so so Jake, um, coming to the U.S. at that time, despite the fact that it was, you know, a very, uh, it was a very difficult time for America. I got to tell you that for me at that time, you know, more than 15 years ago as an immigrant, I, I couldn't have, I couldn't have felt more welcome because I think that's the spirit, right, of of our country. So for me personally, I feel that, you know, I, I was welcomed and I feel, uh, you know, I, I honestly felt I had entered a world of opportunity. Now, I went through a lot of struggle, probably more struggle than the average person not only as an immigrant, but because a lot of uh, unexpected things happened to me. But overall, I would say that, you know, heck, you know, America afforded me the kind of opportunities I wouldn't have had anywhere else. Well, and I'd love to take back just before you came to America and talk about what was life like in preparing to come over here. And then you came over here and then what happened? You, you come off an airplane or you, you know, what, how'd that situation transpire? So it's interesting, you know, um, so uh, when I came to the U.S., this was back in August of 2002, I um, I landed in J- at, at JFK Airport and, you know, uh, some friends gave me a ride to this place called the Big Apple Hostel in, uh, in Times Square in New York City. I don't know how much that place costs now, Jake, but back in those days, it was about $20 a night. So I found myself in, 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 a, in a place called the Big Apple Hostel in, in downtown Manhattan. Um, you know, sort of sleeping in a room, uh, in in a sort of a bunk bed with, there were four other people in the room and, you know, it was basically, I guess, a place where, you know, students who, uh, you know, sort of needed an inexpensive place could stay. Uh, you know, I need to check. I bet the place is still there today. I don't know how much they charge now. It would be fun to go check it out. It really would be interesting because I would imagine that the $20 has, has probably gone up a little bit. (laughs) <laughs> I, I would hope so at the very least. So a lot of interesting things happen in those first few days. Uh, I'll tell you a, a couple of funny stories. A, I went up to this hot dog stand uh, in downtown Manhattan and I asked for directions and the guy looks at me and goes, you need to buy something if I'm going to give you directions. And I, I, you know, I was such an idiot. I bought something because I didn't know any better. So I bought something. I bought a bottle of water for like two fifty, and you know, most money I'd ever spent in my whole life for water. And um, I did that, and then you know, I had, uh, I had, I think I had about five hundred dollars. That was you know all the savings I had. 
I walked into uh, one of these, I think it was a Duane Reed. And then I saw these dollar meals. I'm like, whoa, I can eat for a dollar. And then I bought a, you know, and then of course it wasn't filling. So I ate two, I ate two of them. And then I was sitting in the bathroom for several hours the next day because, you know, that's not really, you know, um, it's not really the kind of food you want to live on. So I had all of these unusual, funny, silly, entertaining stories and, uh, and, you know, I mean, um, <laughs> it was fun. It was, it was, you know, I, I wouldn't, I wouldn't, I wouldn't change anything. I loved it. And so many of the listeners to this podcast have never been through this experience, you know, including myself. And I kind of want to get a feel for, did you have a plan as you came off the plane in JFK? Here you are in a different country, uh, different languages, different opportunities. You know, you, you didn't know about buying water and, and getting directions, of course. And so how did, did you have a plan as you came out? You know, the only plan I had because, um, you know, I was, I was offered a job and, uh, you know, at that time it was, uh, what is it? I think the job was about $28,000 a year. So my paycheck was about 600 a paycheck after taxes, um, which was all the money in the world to me at that time. The, my only objective was to stay loyal to my employer, to do a good job, to keep my head down, to work hard and to make the place where I was working successful. Because for me that, you know, that was sort of the reason I was here in the country. I had no inclination that I would well, first of all, that job didn't work out. That's a whole separate story in itself because, you know, um, it, it was a two-man operation. It was my boss and me, and the business wasn't doing well. So my boss came up to me and said, Nitin, you're great, but one of us has to go. It can't be me. <laughs> so, you know, I, I obviously, I wasn't expecting that to happen, but it happened. But I had no inclination, no inclination, Jake, at that time that I would, you know, go through the struggles I did, start my own business, become a United States citizen marry an amazing woman, live in a nice house, have a son with another daughter on the way, have my mom fly business class. All this obviously took 10 to 15 years to happen, but I had no inclination. I was just trying to live day by day and, you know, and make my employer proud because he was the one who had sponsored my work visa to come to the country. So I had, you know, I was a, I had very simple goals and uh, loyalty was my number one driver, not, not this kind of ambition to build multiple businesses that came later. Well, and I love in, that you brought that up because there's two things I want to pull out of what you just talked about. The first being that your goal was loyalty. And I think that is so vitally important, especially today where we have a lot of people who are doing side jobs. We call them sidepreneurs. We call them, you know, the, the evening and weekend warriors where they're going out and trying to build entrepreneurial businesses on the side. But the first thing you need to recognize is this loyalty to your employer, someone who's taken a chance on you that's given you an opportunity and doing what you can to provide that value back to them. That's step number one. The second thing that you talked about that I think is really great is, you know, you didn't have this plan to start with. It evolved, it developed. And now you're at a position where you can bring your mom out on business class and have some of these luxuries and nice things, but it didn't happen overnight. You said it took 10 to 15 years to build this. And I think that's one thing that we need to remember as entrepreneurs, as business leaders, is that it's not an overnight success. It's hard work. Now, Nitin, before we go on to some of these other topics I definitely want to talk about, I want to ask you, as you came in, were you living in New York City then making $28,000 a year? Oh, gosh, no, I was actually only in New York City for the first couple of weeks till I could uh, find a place to stay. I actually ended up uh, in a one bedroom apartment sharing uh, an apartment with uh, with a guy from Turkey. And no, I was only in New York City for the first, what was it, I think, uh, what was it, 10 to 14 days while I was, you know, looking up Craigslist to find an affordable place near my work, which was in New Jersey. So, um, yeah. Okay, but New Jersey is still not a very cost effective or inexpensive place to live. So 28,000, you come in and you're doing what you need to do. And I kind of gave in the intro to this podcast, you know, some of the sacrifices that you made. And I love that story of struggle and triumph and doing what you need to do to be successful. But I want to jump now and talk about your businesses a little bit. And I want to talk about this idea of bootstrapping. And can you give us a flavor of what bootstrapping is and how it played a part, how it played a role in your business development? So, you know, bootstrapping is being able to fund uh, your business yourself uh, through strategic financing in the beginning when you have no money. And I'll explain what that means. 
And as you make money, uh, you know, don't go out and do something. Don't go out and please, please don't go out and buy a nice car or, you know, um, or drop a lot of money on things that are not going to help you go, you know, sort of use it to to uh, grow the existing business or start a second business which feeds off of the first business. Now, what do I mean by that? Well, first of all, um, I had no money. Uh, well, I would go so far as to say I had literally no money. Uh, up until 2009, 2010. When I say no money, I mean I could just barely pay my bills. What happened between 2007 and 2010 was I started to understand strategically how to use money. Uh, let me give you a very specific example. Back in those days, and by the way, this still exists today, Bank of America had a business card called the, um, it was called the Cash Rewards Visa business card, uh, Visa or MasterCard, I don't remember. Now, that business card, Jake, had a 0% APR, as in 0% interest for nine months. Yeah. So what I did was, I mean, I had good credit. In 2007, I applied, you know, I got approved with a $20,000 limit. So what I did was I, I used that money to, you know, pay my independent contractors by PayPal because PayPal lets you pay other people using a credit card. I was able to use it to, uh, you know, uh, pay pay my bills, stuff like that. And by the end of nine or 10 months, uh, I'd made sure I made the monthly minimum payments. But by the end of nine or 10 months, you know, I had an eighteen, nineteen thousand dollars credit card bill, but I was able to grow the business sufficiently to pay it off in one shot. And so in those days, you know, that, that sort of gave me the room, the breathing room to sort of, you know, take off. Cause I, I didn't have, you know, I didn't have $20,000 in my bank account. No way. So, um, the strategic use of money and, and to be honest, I did that again, over the next two or three years, I was able to call Bank of America and say, hey, guess what? Increase my limit. And, you know, through, uh, you know, you, you're able to increase your limit. Sure. You're even able to get a new card and roll over the credit limit from the old card to the new card. There's all sorts of things you can do as long as, you know, you have good credit, you're responsible with money. Uh, the, I think the financial system is set to reward people who know how to float money and grow money. And um, I sort of became a master at that back in the day. And then when the businesses did start making money, I didn't go out and buy anything new. Just so that you know, Jake, I still drive the same Honda Civic that I bought back in 2007. I use a laptop. I use my MacBook Pro that I've had for six years. I buy my clothes at Kohl's and at Costco. I don't take my, you know, I don't take the profits and go out and buy nice things. I mean, sure, when I travel, I travel business and, you know, I eat at nice places, but that's the extent of it. I take the money from business A to further grow business A or to start business B, which can then, uh, you know, sort of be an adjunct or an ancillary, uh, an additional offering to business A, which then allows me to provide more than one type of product or service to the same audience. That's very important. Because you're not trying to work in multiple different arenas or industry. You're looking at what your target client needs, what your industry needs, and you're providing ancillary types of products and opportunities to them. I think we need to back up just a second and find out what your business is, how you grew it during this period of 2007 to 2010. We understand the bootstrapping of it, but what, what was your business and how were you growing it? So we've, my company has evolved from a business to business company, which we still are to a business to consumer company, because our goal is to, you know, uh, connect the two. And I'll, uh, I'll explain what that means. But to answer your question, I am a physical therapist. I'm a licensed physical therapist. So is my wife. So in 2007, we, uh, we introduced physical therapy, email newsletter marketing software. The name of the company was and still is therapynewsletter.com. We started conducting workshops, teaching other physical therapists how to build their business. We've helped physical therapists, you know, uh, become successful through, you know, strategic marketing methods that involve, you know, um, sort of consistent, relevant communication. And so, yeah, in a nutshell, business coaching software for physical therapists was uh, what my core business was and still is to this day because I am a physical therapist by profession. So that was all I did from 2007, sorry, excuse me, 2007, all the way up until today, actually. Now, when did you become a physical therapist? Is this something you did prior to coming to the United States, something you studied here and took to a next level? When did that begin? Yeah, both. I actually uh, was a licensed physical therapist back in India. 
And when I moved to the US, I got my physical therapy license uh, before, uh, you know, before I started working as a physical therapy coach. So yes, uh, I'm sorry, as a physical therapy business coach. So I was a, a physical therapist, a PT from back in India. Uh, and in the US, I did have to take the exam to get my license in New York and New Jersey, which I did. And so when you first started out, you said you were B2B. And so you were working with other physical therapy chains or offices to help them run what their marketing, their development. Exactly. And we provided them with software to help them market their practice and get more patients, which we still do. In fact, now we offer even more software solutions than we did back then. But in a nutshell, software systems and business coaching to help other physical therapists become more successful. Wonderful. So thanks for giving us that background, because I think it really helps us to kind of see this path, this journey that you're on. I mean, one of the things we talk about a lot on Modern Leadership is that success is a journey. It's a path that we need to stay on and work hard at. And it comes with ups and it comes with downs. And so one of the things I wanted to talk to you about is how do we prepare for some of those ups and some of those downs? And I love that you talk about preparing also for the ups, not just the downs, even though we're going to face both of them throughout our careers. You know, I think uh, preparing for the ups has a lot to do with the, your feeling of self-worth, Jake, because sometimes when people become successful, part of them, uh, and I know this happened to me, part of them feels do I deserve this? Am I good enough? Gosh, I feel so lucky, luckier than anyone else, more fortunate than anyone else. And so I'm going to blow it or I'm going to do something to screw it up. I'm going to do something to sabotage myself or self-destruct. So I think having a feeling of self-worth where you say, you know what, now that I've gone from point A to point B, I'm going to consolidate my position by setting up a retirement fund, by setting up a college fund, by starting another business, by, you know, by saving, uh, you know, for, for other things that matter, maybe even by helping others uh, who are less fortunate than me. So I think having a sort of a sense of self-worth and a very clear identity uh, of what makes you happy allows you to prepare for the ups because otherwise, you know, you're just, otherwise you're going to screw it up. It's just human nature. Well, this is huge. I think you're absolutely right with this because, you know, we often go through this feeling within ourselves that I'm not worthy, I haven't worked hard enough, or who am I to have this success? And then subconsciously, and I think what you're saying is we don't intentionally sabotage our efforts. It's subconscious that we do that. And it's all about having that strong self-worth. Now, Nitin, within the Modern Leadership platform, we talk about the five leadership superpowers. And one of them is confidence, because I think confidence or that internal self-worth, and I'm not talking about arrogance, but confidence is so vitally important. If you want to be successful, you need to take your small successes and use those as the foundation, the platform for your bigger successes. And I think that's what you're saying. One thing that I wanted to ask you about then is how does mentoring or those learning from others play a role in your life and in the life of somebody on this journey and path to success? And the reason I ask you this is I love this. You have a two-year-old son who is your mentor. And I got to hear this story. <laughs> uh, the reason mentors are important is because, you know, they teach you about, they teach you, they give you clarity and they teach you about the importance of simplicity. Some of my business coaches and mentors, and I have a few, have taught me to improve not only the way I uh, design and sell products and services and market them, because, you know, the, those are strategies that change every now and then, depending on, depending on, you know, the, depending on the state of the market. For example, you know, Facebook is huge today. It was it wasn't huge five years ago. Right. But right. more importantly, they've they've you know I, I've I've my my relationship with money has improved, uh, Jake. What I mean by that is um, I know that not only providing value but having sort of a certain sort of sense of a certain aura of of uh, um, you know creativity and a positive perception in the market is important for attracting money. Uh, individuals who attract money tend to tend to sort of understand the forces that cause money to move. They they attract money because they not only do a good job, but they transform some clients. Not all you can't transform everybody. They uh, they understand they need to be quote unquote famous or well known within their community. Um, and they most importantly they understand that money moves because uh, you know because of perceptions of people people who don't make money or people who complain that they don't make enough money or struggle are people who have an a sort of they 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 have an animosity with money in other words they, they they're actually people who make more money and then become physically uncomfortable 
I call and I used again I used to be like this. I call such individuals individuals with poverty consciousness. Again, how does all this tie back to my son? I'll get there. I promise I'll get there in 30 seconds. But um an individual with poverty consciousness thinks it's hard to make money is always thinking of is always thinking of saving money, pinching pennies as opposed to making money. An individual with poverty consciousness thinks that m- most rich people don't deserve their money because you know oh they are you know they inherited it or they are lucky or whatever and an individual with poverty consciousness generally tends to um have a negative relationship with money they they think that you know too much money is evil or you have to do evil things to get too much money so i think again improving my relationship with money and overcoming my negative programming so that i can attract money uh, was a huge part of my success how does all this tie back to my son well my son has taught me that the simple things lead to um and i gosh i'm so sorry that might be him in the background i don't know if you can hear him but i swear you know i'm i'm in a different part of the house and i didn't want him to uh, sort of you know uh, uh, sort of you guys to hear him sorry about that but it was on cue it was part of the show it's so funny it's so it's 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 kind of weird <laughs> if you think about it but um my son has taught me about the importance of simplicity of clarity for example i could you know i could buy my son you know uh, um pretty much the most the fanciest toy but guess what if i play with him if i just take him outside and he gets to play in the grass that gives him more happiness and more joy than you know sort of a, a tesla motor car they have teslas for kids i don't even know if you knew that well i have a rule nitin and, and this is my rule none of my kids are getting a tesla before i do that's the rule love it love it and you know what uh, this reminds me of something kevin o'leary said from shark tank i was listening to one of his speeches uh, and he said when he and his son fly as soon as they enter the plane kevin makes a left towards the business section his son makes a right towards economy interesting <laughs> and he said he he told his son guess what you got to earn it so yeah. good luck to you when you earn it you can sit in business so i want my son and i think we should all do this as parents i want kids to sort of uh, learn and appreciate the finer things and not just get it handed to them because the the degree to which you struggle is directly proportional to the degree to which you become resilient and successful but i know this isn't a parenting class this is about why i consider my son my mentor i consider him my mentor because he he helps me understand the importance of simplicity it's the simple things that matter not the fancy complex you know sort of multidimensional campaigns and strategies and customer voodoo it's just simple things that matter right i mean i don't need to i'll give you an example of how i've applied his approach to you know our business we can send text messages we can send automated emails we can send letters but guess what we just pick up the phone and call our customers and they are happy about that so you know at the end of the day the simple things matter and my son has taught me about the value of simplicity and the fact that you know money is crucial but it's not the only thing that's going to make you happy sometimes the things that make you the happiest require little or no money i think you've made a couple of points here that i think are really important to bring out one is certainly this money can't make you happy you know it's this uh things don't make you happy it's the experiences and that but one of the other things that you talked about is this simplicity and i think it's so vitally important as technology has evolved things have gotten so complex we have the ability to do so much with our businesses and it's created this overwhelm we talk about people who are on their phones 24/7 you know they have them lying by their bed at 2 in the morning they pick them up and receive text messages we have overcomplicated a lot of the things that we do in business and if we take a step back and really look at the simplicity behind it and just pick up the phone and call our our clients or our customers and really get back somewhat to the old fashioned ways that we used to do things now i'm not suggesting that technology is bad and that we don't need to use it because i think a lot of technology and i think you would agree nitin especially you guys use a lot of technology and software with your physical therapy practices i'm not suggesting that technology is bad but when it's used only to add complication layers of difficulty and complication to our work then we need to really evaluate can we do this more simply and i think there's two key benefits in it and if i can uh share with these 
two benefits of doing that. Number one is it's faster. It's efficient. We're going to get it done quicker and probably more cost effective. Number two is we have a limited amount of brain power that we can use. And if we are using up all our brain, our decision making, our strategy on these difficult problems, then we don't have the mental capacity to solve some of the other problems that we're going to face. And so really huge advantages, I think, to what you just talked about, simplifying, and we can learn that from our kids. Does that kind of wrap up? Absolutely. Wonderful. Well, Nitin, I wanted to talk with you a little bit about health. I was excited to talk about some of these health concepts that you have, and I know that your book focuses a lot on this, health concepts, but before we wrap up, can we just touch briefly on the real meaning of health and what inside out health is for us? Absolutely. Now, for me, uh, the philosophy of total activation, you can learn more on our website at totalactivation.com, is about not only uh, what you put inside your body, in other words, the nutrition and the supplements you consume, but about what you put on your body. That's why we have both skincare and nutritional products on our website. Uh, From a broader standpoint, we consider total activation to be about five components, E for emotional, P for physical, S for social, S for spiritual and I for intellectual. So that's E-P-S-S-I. Emotional health, doing the things that make you happy. Physical health, taking care of your body, whether it's exercise or nutrition. Social health, surrounding yourself with people who make you happy and stepping away from people who make you unhappy. Spiritual, having a sense of purpose and a sense of meaning, whether it's religion, whether it's trying to help others, something that sort of gives your life a higher sense of direction. And finally, I for intellectual, doing things to challenge your brain, whether it's, you know, reading the newspaper, doing a crossword puzzle, learning a new musical instrument or a new, even new language, but emotionally, physically, socially, spiritually, and intellectually challenging your body and using skincare products and nutritional supplements that work hand in hand with each other. And you can get more information at totalactivation.com if you like. And we are whole individuals, meaning that the things we do with our health affect the things we do at work and the things we do at work affect our home life. It's a, it's a circle that goes around and around that where we're operating at highest efficiency and effectivity in all of our areas of life. Well, then we'll pick up the slack in some of the areas that may be lacking or areas that we need to improve on. And so that's why I thought it was really important that we at least touch briefly on that. Now, Nitin, it's been great to chat with you and I love your story. I love this hard work, this overcoming obstacles, doing what needs to be done to reach a level of success that you're proud of today, that we're all proud of, and that you're still moving in that direction of up. You're still working hard to improve and do more. Before we let you go, I'd love to round out this conversation, getting to know you a little bit better on a personal level by finding out some of the things that you're reading and watching and some of the philosophies that you believe in, a section I call learning from leaders. Are you ready to jump in five or six rapid fire questions? Absolutely. Perfect. All right. The first one then, book currently on your Kindle or bedside table. Um, so the book is called No Man's Land, a survival guide to a survival manual for growing mid-sized companies. And uh, the author is Doug Tatum. And how do you like that book so far? Excellent book for those who are trying to grow medium-sized companies and make them huge juggernauts. It kind of explains the struggles we have gone through and to some extent what we are going through as we try and become bigger. Now, is it written in a more academic format or more of a storytelling as you can kind of read through it and enjoy the story as it goes? More of a storytelling format. Really good book. Very nice. You know, Nitin, there's a million books on Amazon. And so we love this section because we want to hear what other people are reading so that we can kind of narrow that down just a little bit. So we have No Man's Land down. How about the best movie ever made? Uh, um, you know what? I like... Um, um... The Oliver Stone movie, uh, oh, why is my brain freezing? Um, the one with Gordon Gecko, Wall Street. Yeah, Wall Street. Because um, because I think it represents, um, you know, the, the negative aspect of greed uh, and, and how it clashes with, you know, with uh, how it sort of disrupts people's lives if, it's, if it goes overboard. And then uh, obviously the character does the right thing in the end. So Wall Street's one of my favorite movies. How about your leadership superpower? Being able to hire the right people because I can tell pretty quickly uh, who's an A player and who's, you know, sort of going to be not a good fit, maybe even a waste of time for our company. And if you want to go to the next level, you've got to surround yourself with good people. You can't do it all and excel at the peak level 
by yourself. You need to bring in good people that can help take you to that next level. So I couldn't agree more. Great superpower. How about a philosophy, mantra, or motivational quote that you use in your life? Um, The definition of insanity is doing the same thing over and over again and expecting different results. I don't know who said that. But, um, but you know, uh, you've always got to shake things up, do new things in business, whether it's modifying your marketing approaches or your product so that you can, so that you can stay relevant. That's absolutely right. When you plateau, you don't, nobody just stays the same. You're either moving forward or you're taking a step back. How about if you could leave just one leadership trait to your son and your daughter or to the next generation, what would it be? Being humble and being uh, sort of considerate towards others. Because if you're if you're going to do that during the good times, uh, you're going to be able to survive the bad times. If you become arrogant and you let it get to you, and you become uh, an a hole, um, you know you uh, you're going to be all alone when things go south. And trust me, things will go south. Uh, things are going to go south, and they will go south in business. Uh, and the stakes get higher the higher you climb. So be humble, uh, enjoy the good, but uh, be humble so you can weather the bad. And I will tell you, Nitin, right here on my wall, my daughter wrote me a sign, and I'll turn and read it. It says, Dad, be helpful, happy, healthy, and hustle. And I think that really says, Dad, be humble if you want to be successful. So I love that. How about finally the best book ever written? That's an interesting one. Um, I would say Influence by Dr. Robert Cialdini. Um, Talks about, you know, what it takes to influence other people and get them well, what makes people tick? So, yeah. Now, are you aware that uh, Dr. Cialdini has a brand new book that just came out called Persuasion? Persuasion. Yep, yep. I'm I'm aware of that book as well, and I have read that as well. So, I like that. And so, would you recommend the new one? Because we have that on our book club book coming up next year, early 2018. We will be diving into Persuasion. Do you recommend it? I think it's an excellent book, and I would say it's definitely up there with one of the best books I've ever read. I like Influence. It's my number one book. Very nice. Well, Nitin, I appreciate your time with us today. It's great to really hear your story. Before we let you go, any last bit of advice that you have, and then how can we get in touch with you a little bit more? Jake, if any of your listeners want to go to www.totalactivation.com, and if they mention your name and contact us through the Contact Us page, Uh, we'll give them a discount to any of our products. That's number one. Number two, if any of them want any business advice, um, they can mention your name and send us a message. And then I will make sure that I reply to the message. My team will forward it to me as long as your name, Jake, is mentioned because that way we know they're your listeners. And I will respond to each and every person who contacts us mentioning your name. It may not be right away. It may take a few weeks, but I promise I will respond. And that's my way of paying it forward and thanking you for the opportunity. Oh, well, I can't thank you enough, Denton. My name is the magic key. So Mm -hmm. use that. All right. Well, thank you for spending this time with us. And uh, we want to wish you the best of days. Stay awesome, Denton. Thank you. Thank you. All right, my friends, I hope that you enjoyed our discussion with Nitin Choda. It was great to have someone with this unique background, this unique story about coming to America right after 9-11 and finding his place, his success through hard work, through commitment, through passion. Just love that story of rising up and doing what you need to do to be successful. I think we all have to go through that fight in life, right? I mean, it doesn't mean we have to be immigrants and it doesn't mean that we have to sleep in our car or wait until the the restaurant patrons go home in order to find that success. But what it does mean is there are sacrifices that we need to take. And I appreciate Nitin sharing his sacrifices and struggles with us. Of course, everything that we talked about, you can find on the show notes for this episode, which will be episode 39. And so jakeacarlson.com slash ML39 will be all the show notes for this page. A couple of the key takeaways just to briefly mention before I let you go. He talked about having a few business coaches. And I think having a business coach is so vitally important. If you want to go to the next level, learn from those who have either gone there or have the expertise to take you there. No sports star is doing it alone. They all have coaches that help take them to that next level, and so should we in business. The other thing that I wanted to 
bring out is he talked about his relationship with money has evolved. It has changed. We have to have a positive relationship with money. It doesn't mean that we need to be greedy or arrogant or make money our all-consuming passion, but it does mean we need to understand the value of money, how to go after it, and the impact that it can make on our lives and on our businesses. And then finally, poverty conscious. I love this terminology that he talked about. It ties right in with what we just talked about, our relationship with money. Make it simple. Don't make things overly complex. Again, thanks to Nitin. Thank you for helping make this podcast as successful as it's been. As you know, I love sitting down with you and doing these interviews. Next week, we're going to have a lot of fun. I will see you next week. But until then, have a great day, make a great life, and stay awesome. Thanks for listening to the Modern Leadership Podcast. You can find me on Facebook at Speaker Jake, on Twitter at Jake A. Carlson, and of course the website, jakeacarlson.com. See you there. Bye.